Chapter Twenty Eight of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight More of the Bees. Of the real palpitating horror of the situation, only three people around the table knew the true inwardness. They were Tchigorsky and Ralph and Mrs. May. Geoffrey guessed much, and probably Marion could have said a deal, had she cared to. Her face was smiling again, but the uneasy, haunted look never left her eyes. And all through the elaborate, daintily served meal, Mrs. May never glanced at the girl once. And yet, here under the Ravenspur roof, partaking of the family hospitality, was the evil itself. Ralph smiled to himself grimly as he wondered what his father would say if he knew the truth. Once or twice as he spoke, Mrs. May glanced at him curiously. She was herself now. She might have been an honored guest at that table for years. "'Your face is oddly familiar to me,' she said. "'I regret I cannot say the same,' Ralph replied. I am blind. But you have not always been blind. No, but my misfortune dates back for a number of years. It is a matter that I do not care to discuss with anybody. But Mrs. May was not to be baffled. She had an odd feeling that this man and herself had met before. The face was the same and yet not the same. "'Were you ever in Tibet?' she asked. "'I had a brother who once went there,' Ralph replied. "'I am accounted like him. "'It is possible you may have met my brother, madam.' The speech was sullen, delivered with a stupid air that impressed Mrs. May that she had nothing to fear from him. And yet the words had a curious effect on her. Her face changed color, and for the first time she glanced at Marion. The girl was trembling. She was ashy gray to her lips. Tchigorsky, observing, smiled. "'Tibet is a wonderful country,' he said, "'and Lhasa a marvelous city. I had some of my strangest experiences there. I and another man, since dead, penetrated all the secrets of the holy city. It was only by a miracle that I escaped with my life. But these I will carry to my grave." He indicated the scars on his face. Vera was profoundly interested. "'Tell me something of your adventures there,' she said. "'Some day, perhaps,' Tchigorsky replied. For the most part they were too horrible. I could tell you all about the beasts and birds and insects. I see you have some bees outside, Miss Vera. Did you ever see Tibet bees?" "'Are they different to ours?' Vera asked. Tchigorsky glanced up. Mrs. May was regarding him with more than a flattering interest. A slight smile, almost a defiance, parted her lips. Marion was looking down at her plate, crumbling a piece of bread absently. "'Some of them,' said Tchigorsky. "'Some are black, for instance. I have a place in Kent where I dabble in that kind of thing. I have a few of the bees with me.' Tchigorsky took a small box from his pocket and laid it on the table. Vera inspected the black bees for a moment, and then handed them back to Tchigorsky. By accident or design he let the box fall, the lid flew open, and immediately half a dozen sable objects were buzzing in the air. A yell of terror broke from Mrs. May, a yell that rang to the roof. She jumped to her feet only to sink again with the pain of the injured limb. She seemed to have lost all control of herself. 
she turned and addressed Tchigorsky in some liquid tongue that conveyed nothing to anyone except that she was denouncing the Russian in a fury of passionate anger. Geoffrey had risen, too, greatly alarmed. From the head of the table, Ralph Ravenspur coolly demanded to know what it was all about. "'The man is mad!' Mrs. May screamed. "'He is a dangerous lunatic. Those are the black bees of Tibet. They are the most fearsome of insects. Ah!' One of the droning objects dropped on her hand, and she yelled again. She was a picture of abject and pitiable terror. "'I am doomed, doomed,' she moaned. "'Killed by a careless madman.' "'Is there any danger?' Geoffrey demanded. Only the life led among so many perils caused the family to wait calmly for the next and most dramatic development. Perhaps the way in which Tchigorsky was behaving gave them confidence. If he was a madman, as Mrs. May asserted, then the madman was wonderfully calm and placid. "'You are alarming yourself unnecessarily,' he said. "'See here.' He reached over and took the bee from Mrs. May's arm. The insect had become entangled in her sleeve and was buzzing angrily. "'The little creature is furious,' he said. "'As a matter of fact, they are always more or less furious. If there is any danger, there is danger now.' He held the bee lightly in his hand. Then he released it. "'The stings have been removed,' he said. "'I bred these myself, and I know how to treat them. I am sorry to have caused a disturbance.' He spoke with serious, earnest politeness, but there was a mocking light in his eyes as he turned upon Mrs. May. Nobody had a thought or a glance for anybody else, and the spectacle of Marion lying back, half fainting in her chair, passed unnoticed. "'Then they are usually dangerous?' Vera asked. "'My dear young lady, they are dreadful,' Tchigorsky explained. "'They invade other nests and eat the honey as they might have invaded your hives. By way of experiment I tried one of these on your hives tonight, and your bees seemed to recognize an enemy at once.' They all deserted their hives, and not one of them has returned. As some amends for what I have done, I am going to send you two of the finest swarms in England." Vera shuddered. "'I shall never want to see a bee again,' she said. Once more the eyes of Tchigorsky and Mrs. May met. She knew well that Tchigorsky was talking at her through the rest and that in his own characteristic way he was informing her that the last plot had failed. With a queer smile on her face she proceeded to peel a peach. "'You are so horribly clever,' she said, "'that I feel half afraid of you. But I don't suppose we shall meet again.' "'Not unless you come to Russia,' said Tchigorsky, "'whither I start to-morrow.' but I am leaving my affairs in competent hands." Again was the suggestion of a threat. Again Mrs. May smiled. The smile was on her face long after the three most interested in the tragedy had left the dining hall and gone to the billiard room for a smoke. "'Are you really leaving us?' Geoffrey asked. "'I want Mrs. May to imagine so,' said Tchigorsky. "'In a day or two her spies will bring her information that I have left England. As a matter of fact, I have succeeded in tapping a vein of information that has baffled me for a long time. Still, I am not going away, and my disguise will be the one you saw me in. If luck goes well, I shall be attached to Mrs. May in the character of a native servant before long. 
so if you see any suspicious-looking Asiatic prowling about, don't put a bullet into him, for you may kill me by mistake. Geoffrey smiled and promised. That was a rare fright you gave Mrs. May over the bees, he said. How did you manage it? Chigorsky smiled as he lighted a cigarette. I stole them from the woman's spare supply, he said. I have been all over her possessions today. I almost suffocated the horrible little things and removed their stings. Of course, they won't live many hours. I did it in a spirit of mischief, intending to release them in my lady's own sitting-room. I couldn't resist the temptation to try her nerves tonight. "'You are getting near the truth?' Geoffrey asked. "'Very near it. We want certain evidence to bring the whole gang into the net, and then we shall strike, if they don't murder us first. But—' The speaker paused as Vera entered the room. "'Where is Mrs. May?' Geoffrey asked. "'She has gone to her room,' Vera explained. "'Her foot is so painful that she has decided to accept an invitation to spend the night here.' "'Good,' Chigorsky muttered. "'It could not have been better.'" End of chapter 28Chapter Twenty Nine of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Nine Mrs. May at Ravenspur. The woman known as Mrs. Mona May had lost no time in adapting herself to circumstances. That she had found her way on to the terrace for no good purpose was known to three people although in all probability she imagined that Tchigorsky alone was acquainted with her designs. He had laid a trap for her, and to a certain extent he had forced her hand. But she was too brilliant and unscrupulous a woman not to be able to turn misfortune to her own advantage. And was she not here, here a guest among those who for some reason she hated from her soul? why it matters not for the present from mrs may's point of view tchigorsky alone knew and tchigorsky was going away ere long but whether tchigorsky remained or not mrs mona may could defy him to prove that she was in any way connected with the misfortunes of the ravenspurs once the man she had most reason to dread had withdrawn to the billiard room the adventuress lost no time in ingratiating herself with her involuntary hosts. This was the woman with whom Geoffrey had dined. Vera regarded her curiously. She was very beautiful and fascinating. She had a manner that attracted. Her conversation was bright and interesting. "'You must not mind me,' she said to Vera and you must not grudge me a little of your lover's company." Vera blushed divinely. "'How did you guess that?' she asked. "'Oh, there are signs, my dear. I have had my own romance, and I know. But women of my age can never really rival young girls like yourself. We lack the one great charm.' "'I should not have thought so,' said Vera. Mrs. May patted the girl playfully on the cheek. "'That is a very pretty compliment,' she replied. "'But it does not alter facts. A woman of forty may be fascinating. She has the brilliant parts. But, alas, it is only once that she can possess youth.' The speaker turned away with a gentle sigh and began to discuss the art treasures in the drawing-room with Mrs. Gordon. All the time Marion had held coldly aloof from the stranger. "'You are not like yourself tonight,' Vera murmured. Marion's dark eyes were lifted. 
there were purple rings under those eyes and a hunted expression on the white face it was the face of one who has seen a terror that it is impossible to forget am i not she said indifferently perhaps so don't you like that woman vera asked frankly i don't marion admitted but there are reasons strange that you don't recognize the likeness between us geoffrey did at once vera started strange indeed that she had not noticed it before and now that marion had spoken the likeness was surprising making allowance for the disparity of years the two faces were the same is there another mystery vera asked marion smiled like her old self indeed there is she confessed but it is a poor vulgar little thing beside your family mystery mrs may is a connection of mine as a matter of fact she is closely related to my mother's family she is not a good woman and i hope you will see as little of her as possible but i suppose she came to see you oh dear no she would never have done that she knows perfectly well that i should strongly oppose her coming here beyond question her taking up her residence for the benefit of her health in this village was simply a coincidence. Vera looked closely at the visitor. Mrs. May doesn't look like an invalid, she said. She doesn't. It is her heart. Any sudden excitement might be fatal to her. Is it not strange that I have the seeds of the same complaint? you marion i never heard that before and you are here oh yes i am here a bad place for heart troubles you would say but i am young and strong i merely made the remark perhaps it would have been better had i not said anything about it mrs may was talking she protested gently against the trouble she was causing indeed there was no reason why she should not have gone back to her farm still her kind friends were so very pressing she would stay the night but she must be up and away early in the morning she had pressing business tiresome law business to see to in york and now i am not going to keep you up any longer she said with a brilliant smile who will help me upstairs will you dear she had risen to her feet and approached marion the girl seemed to shrink back it looked as if she was being dragged into some painful undertaking then the natural sweetness of her disposition conquered her dislike if you think i can manage it she said mrs may hobbled upstairs leaning on marion's shoulder chatting gaily the latter helped her into the room set apart for the involuntary guest and at a sign closed the door all her smiles and pretty feminine blandishments vanished her eyes were dark and hard her manner was cold and stinging you fool hissed mrs may this is a nice thing you have done marion smiled wearily she seemed to have suddenly fallen under the mantle of years. She dropped into a chair like somebody old and weary. "'What have I done?' she asked. "'Fallen in love with Geoffrey Ravenspur.' The words came like a blow. Marion staggered under them. "'I deny it,' she said weakly. "'It is false.' it is true you idiot you are blushing like a rose and tonight when that fiend tchigorsky played that fool's trick upon us you had no eyes for anyone but geoffrey frightened as i was i could see that your looks betrayed you what are you going to do about it 
Marion shook her head sadly. Never had any one at Ravenspur ever seen her look so forlorn and dejected as she did at this moment. "'I don't know,' she said hopelessly. "'I know what I ought to do. I ought to kill you and throw myself into the sea afterwards. Why should I go on leading my present life? Why should I shield you? What are you? What are you to me?' "'You dare ask me that question?' "'Oh, I dare anything in my present mood. Still, I am in your power. You have only to say the word, and it is done.' "'Then why do you take every means of thwarting me?' Marion rose and crossed over to the door. Her eyes were shining. There was a certain restless motion of her hands. "'Take care,' she whispered. "'Don't drive me too far. "'Oh, if I could only live the last four years of my life over again!' End of chapter 29Chapter Thirty, A Leaf from the Past Ralph Ravenspur, with Tchigorsky and Geoffrey, sat smoking in the billiard room until Vera came in to say good night and drive them off to bed. As they were about to separate at the head of the stairs, Ralph gave them a sign to follow him. "'Come to my room for half an hour,' he said. The others complied. Tchigorsky slipped away for a while, and on his return he laid the end of a long silk thread on the white table cover. "'Part of a little scheme,' he said. "'This is one end of the silk thread. Where the other end is matters nothing for the present. Ralph, everybody has retired?' "'Everybody,' Ralph replied as he filled his pipe. I fancy you said that no servants sleep in the house. They have not done so for a long time, Geoffrey explained. Not that we entertain the least suspicion of any of them. We merely made the change for safety's sake. Tchigorsky nodded his approval. He arranged the silk thread neatly on the table, coiling the end round a daisy pattern worked into a damask cloth. "'For Mrs. May's benefit?' Geoffrey asked. "'Precisely,' Tchigorsky said gravely. "'I take a great interest in her.' Geoffrey smoked a whole cigarette before he spoke again. "'By the way,' he exclaimed, "'who and what is Mrs. May?' "'The devil fairly disguised,' Ralph croaked. "'A beautiful Mephistopheles.' a fascinating Beelzebub, a dark-eyed fiend, a, a... He pulled up choking with all-consuming rage. His arm was sawing the air as if feeling for the white throat of his lovely foe. "'Steady there,' Tchigorsky muttered. "'Steady, Ralph, my friend. Shall we enlighten Master Geoffrey a little as to the kind of woman she is?' Ralph nodded over his pipe. "'If you like,' he said, "'only the tale shall be yours. When I come to think of it, I go out of my mind, as I did that night in the Black Valley. Tell him, Tchigorsky, tell him by all means, but not all.' "'Aye, aye. I shall know where to leave off. I'll sit here where I can watch the table.' I am interested in that silk thread. So long as it remains simply coiled up there, I can go on talking. When it moves... You are wasting time, Geoffrey suggested. True, but to make amends, I am going to interest you from the very outset. Doubtless you are curious to know the meaning of those scars on my face, and on the face of your uncle. 
Lately he has managed artistically to disguise his for reasons that will appear later. There was nothing to gain by hiding mine, and pretty ugly they are. These scars were branded on us both at the same time by the priests of the great temple in the hills beyond Lhasa. Three of us had penetrated there, but the other one knew nothing of the mysteries of Buddha for the simple reason that he was the servant of your uncle, one Elphick by name. Elphick is doing good work for us elsewhere, but you shall see him in time. Now these two men, who had disguised themselves as Buddhist priests, and had penetrated all the mysteries of that most mysterious creed, had made a boast two years before at Lahore of what they meant to do and the words of their vaporings were carried to the ears of a woman who was a brahmin though it appeared as if she had abandoned her religion and had married an englishman this englishman had been to lhasa himself and when a girl his wife had fallen in love with him and he married her there was a good deal of scandal about it at the time but there are so many scandals in india that this one was quickly buried under a layer of other slanders. Some said that that officer had managed to pick up some of the holiest mysteries of Buddha, and that the lovely native had married him to close his lips. Certainly he would never speak of Lhasa, and when the place was mentioned he always showed signs of agitation. Well, we went. We were not afraid. Both of us knew the East, we spoke many languages, we could assume any disguise. And in a short time, as honored pilgrims from a far land, we were free of the holy temple in the hills beyond Lhasa. Soon we were picking up all the mysteries. "'Are there any mysteries?' Geoffrey asked. Ralph gave a quick barking laugh like the snap of a pistol shot. All this time his grave wooden smile never relaxed. Ay, Tchigorsky went on, mysteries. The things we saw and the things we learned would have driven many a strong man mad. Occult sciences. What do we know of them? I tell you the greatest man who walks the earth a whole regiment of the finest scientists in Europe would be a set of chattering monkeys alongside a Buddhist priest. We have seen the dead rise from their graves and heard them speak. We came near to learn the secret of eternal life. And yet everlasting life and the unveiling of the future would not tempt me there again. Tchigorsky's voice had fallen to a harsh whisper. As Geoffrey glanced at Ralph, he saw that the latter's face was bathed in a profound perspiration. "'We were thus situated for some months,' Tchigorsky resumed. "'Gradually every mystery connected with life and death was opening up before us, and the secret of universal knowledge was within our grasp. Then one day there was a commotion in the city.' and we found that there was to be a great feast in honor of a princess of the royal blood who had come back to Lhasa after a long pilgrimage. We were bidden to that feast and had places of honor near to the seat of the princess. She came in presently, gorgeously attired in flowing robes and strings of diamonds and emeralds in her hair. She was a magnificent creature. I have seen many a native queen on her throne, but none to compare with that woman who sat flashing her lovely eyes round the table. As I looked at her again and again, I had an odd feeling that I had seen her before. I turned to speak to Ralph here, and beheld with distended eyes and dropped jaw that he was regarding the princess. "'What is it?' I asked. Do you know her, too?" Ralph whispered a few words in my ear, a few pungent words that turned me cold. And what he saw was this. In the princess we had the woman from Lahore, 
the woman who had forsaken her tribe to marry an English officer. We had heard before that she was in the habit of going away for long periods, and we knew that her husband must have possessed himself of Buddhist secrets, perhaps sacred Buddhist script, or that woman would never have been allowed to come and go like this. Had she married an Englishman in the ordinary way, and subsequently returned to Lassa, she would have been torn to pieces. She had been granted absolution on purpose to wrest those secrets from the Englishman who had stolen them, and we too had boasted in the hearing of this woman that we were going to learn those secrets for ourselves. Would she recognize us? That was the question. Remember that we were most carefully disguised. We spoke the language without flaw. We had the same tale to tell, a tale that we had rehearsed over and over again. There was no reason why we should not pass muster. Hope began to revive. Then I looked up and caught that woman's eye, and she smiled. I dream of that smile sometimes at night, and wake up cold and wet and shivering from head to foot. Not that I have more fear than most men, but then I had seen men put to death in Tibet. The torture of the wheel would be a pleasant recreation alongside of death like that. We were recognized. No need to tell us that. Doubtless that woman had followed us step by step, giving us all the latitude we required, and now she had come to teach us the pains and penalties attaching to our office. She favored us with no further glance until the feast had concluded and what passes for music had begun when she honored both of us with a summons to her side. Of course we went. In the circumstances there was nothing else to do. She made room for us. She smiled dazzlingly upon us, and then, slowly and deliberately, as a cat with a mouse, she began to play with us. "'I speak to you thus,' she said, "'because there are others who seek for the secrets of the faith. There were two Christian dogs who came up from Lahore. One was called Chigorsky, the other was called Mayton.' Mayton was your Uncle Ralph's pseudonym, Geoffrey, and they boasted what they were going to do. They knew the language, they said, and behold, the one called Chigorsky was very like you, holy man. It was coming. I bowed gravely as if the comparison was not pleasing to me. A wild yell of hysterical laughter came to my lips, but I managed to suppress that. There were no knives on the table, and I had not dared to use my revolver. Had there been a knife on the table, I should have stabbed that woman to the heart and taken the consequences. "'But your revolver, Chigorsky,' Geoffrey suggested. "'My dear boy, holy fathers and shining lights of the Buddhist faith do not carry regulation army revolvers,' Chigorsky said grimly. All I could do was to wait. "'Did you know those English at Lahore?' the princess asked. I disclaimed the knowledge, saying that at that time I was in Kanpur. Then being closely questioned, I proceeded to give a detailed history of the movements of myself and my companion for the last year or so. I was lying glibly and easily, but I had no comfort from the knowledge. It was easy to see that not one word was believed, and that I was walking into the trap. "'At Darji you were,' said the princess. "'What are the five points of the temple there?' For the life of me I could not tell her. As a matter of fact, I had never been near Darji in my life, and the question was one that any Buddhist who had been there would have answered offhand. I have forgotten, I answered as calmly as possible. I have a bad memory. I forget all kinds of things. 
those dark eyes seem to look me all through you will forget your own name next the princess said i'll remember that i replied i am rane el den at your service then came the reply in excellent english your name is sergius tregorsky and your companion is ralph james mayton i have found you out i have only to raise my hand and your fate is sealed it was all over i said nothing i asked no pity pity you might as well strive to soften the heart of the wounded tiger that has you down with a handful of nuts then i tchigorsky paused his eyes were on the table he pointed to the silken thread that was slowly moving in the direction of the door hush he said softly blow out the light end of chapter 30chapter 31 of the mystery of the ravenspurs by fred m white this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 31 the silk thread intensely interested as he was in the story that tchigorsky had to tell geoffrey nevertheless watched the slowly moving thread on the table gradually and very slowly the silken tag began to draw away from the pattern on the tablecloth, Tchigorsky following it with grim eyes. "'You find it strange?' he asked Geoffrey. "'Strange and thrilling,' Geoffrey replied. "'It appeals to the imagination. Some tragedy may be at the other end of that innocent-looking thread.' "'There may be. There would be if I were not here.' We are dealing with a foe whose cunning and audacity know no bounds. You see, I have been among the foe and know something of their dealings. A passionate anger rose up in Geoffrey as he watched the gliding thread. Then why not drop upon them? he cried. Why not produce your proofs and hand the miscreants over to the police? What good would that do? Tchigorsky replied. Could we prove that the foe had had a direct hand in the tragedies of the past? Could we demonstrate to the satisfaction of a jury that Mrs. May and her confederates were responsible for those poisoned flowers or the bees? And if we get them out of the way, there are others behind them. No, no, they must be taught a lesson. They must know that we are all-powerful, and they must feel the weight of our hands then the painful family scandal you are going too far ralph interrupted warningly tchigorsky checked himself after a glance at geoffrey i am not to be told everything he said why because we dare not ralph murmured it is not that we cannot trust you but because we dare not with this geoffrey was fain to be content by this time the thread had left the table and was lying on the floor. "'The other end is tied to Mrs. May's door,' Tchigorsky explained. "'When that door was cautiously opened, of course, the thread moved. "'Geoffrey, you stay here. "'Ralph, will you go up by the back staircase and get up to the corridor? "'Wait there.' "'Is there danger?' Geoffrey whispered not now said tchigorsky but this audacity passes all bounds that woman had planned to strike a blow at the very moment when she was enjoying the hospitality of this roof the boldness of it would have averted all suspicion from her one of the family mysteriously disappears and is never heard of again in the morning not one lock or bolt or bar is disturbed and yet the member of the family is gone. England would have been startled by the news tomorrow. "'You heard all this?' Geoffrey cried. 
"'Yes,' Chigorsky said quietly. "'That disguise I showed you was useful to me. It is going to be more useful still.' "'But the danger! It must be averted!' Geoffrey whispered. Already Tchigorsky was leaving the room. The lamp had been extinguished, after taking care to place a box of matches close beside it. In the darkness Geoffrey waited, tingling to his fingertips with suppressed excitement. Meanwhile Tchigorsky felt his way along in the darkness. He was counting his steps carefully. He reached a certain spot and then stopped. Ralph strolled down the back staircase and thence down a flagged passage into the hall where he climbed the stairs. Light and darkness, it was all the same to him. There was nobody in the house who could find his way about as well as he. Then he waited for the best part of half an hour. He could hear queer sounds coming from one of the bedrooms, a half cry in light feminine tones a smothered protest, and then the suggestion of a struggle. Yet Ralph never moved toward it. Under cover of the darkness he smiled. Then he heard a door creak and open. He heard footsteps coming along in his direction. The footsteps were stealthy, yet halting. There was the suggestion of the swish of silken drapery. On and on that mysterious figure came until it walked plump into Ralph's arms. There was a faint cry, a cry strangled in its birth. "'Mrs. May,' Ralph said quietly, "'I am afraid I startled you.' The woman was gasping for breath, iron-nerved as she was. She stammered out some halting, stumbling explanation. She was suffering from nervous headache. She was subject to that kind of thing, and there was a remedy she always carried in her jacket pocket, and the jacket was in the hall. "'Go back to your room,' said Ralph. "'I will fetch it for you.' "'There is no occasion,' the woman replied. "'The shock of meeting you has cured me. But what are you doing?' "'Sleeping on the stairs.' Ralph said in his dullest, most mechanical way. "'Sleep? Sleeping on the stairs? Why?' "'I frequently do it. I suffer from insomnia. The accident that deprived me of my sight injured my reason. This is one of my lucid intervals. For years I slept in the open air. The atmosphere of a bedroom stifles me, so I am here.' "'And here you are going to remain all night?' "'Yes. I presume you have no objection.' Mrs. May was silent. Did this man know the terrible position he had placed her in? Was he telling the truth, or was he spying on her? Was he dangerous enough to be removed, or was he the poor creature he represented himself to be?' "'You should get your clever friend Tchigorsky to cure you,' she said. "'Tchigorsky has gone away. I don't know when I shall see him again.' That was good news, at any rate. Mrs. May stooped to artifice. There were reasons why this man should be got out of the way at present. He had brought danger by his stupid eccentricity, but the bold woman was not going to change her plans for that. "'Be guided by me,' she said. "'Go to your room.' "'I am here till the morning,' Ralph said doggedly. "'Go to yours. We are a lost, doomed race. What does it matter what I do?' It was useless to combat sullen obstinacy like this. Mrs. May uttered a few clear words in a language that not one in a million would understand certainly not three people in england it never occurred to her for a moment that ralph ravenspur might be one of the three but he was he listened grimly no doubt the mysterious words had nothing to do with the matter 
but a door in the corridor opened and marion emerged carrying a light in her hand she came swiftly down the corridor her long hair streaming behind her as she saw ralph she gave a sigh of relief come quickly to vera's room she said i want your help in her intense excitement she seemed not to notice mrs may the latter stood aside while the other two passed along she slipped into her own room and closed the door. Foiled, she hissed, and by that poor meaningless idiot. Is it possible that he suspected anything? But no, he is only a fool. If I had only dared, I might have removed him at the same time. On the whole, it was a good thing that Marion did not see me. Without the least trace of excitement, and without hurry, Ralph followed Marion. A light was burning in the room, and Vera, still dressed, was lying on the bed. She was fast asleep, but her face was deadly cold, and her breathing was faint to nothingness. Ralph's fingers rested on her pulse for a minute. "'How long has she been like this?' Ralph asked. I don't know, Marion replied. I was just dropping asleep when I fancied I heard Vera call out. In this house the mere suggestion sufficed. I crept quietly along and came in here. The room was empty, save for Vera, and there was no sign of a struggle. I should have imagined it to be all fancy, but for the queer look in Vera's face. When I touched her, I found her to be deadly cold. Is... is it dangerous? Ralph shook his head. Mysterious as ever, he said. The miscreant is by us, almost in our hands, and yet we cannot touch him. Vera has been rendered insensible by a drug. The effect of it will pass away in time. She will sleep till morning, and you had better remain with her. Of course. I should not dream of leaving the poor child alone. Ralph just touched Marion's cheek. You are a good girl, an angel, he murmured. What we should do without you, I cannot say. Stay here and have no fear. I shall not be far away. I am going to sleep for the rest of the night on the floor outside. On the floor, my dear uncle? Bah, it is no hardship, said Ralph. I have had far less comfortable quarters many a time. I am used to it and like it, and I sleep like a hare. The slightest noise or motion, and I am awake instantly. Marion raised no further protests. This singular individual was in the habit of doing as he pleased, and nothing could turn him from his humor. He bade Marion good night and softly closed the door. But he did not lie down at the head of the stairs. On the contrary, he crept quietly down to his room again. There Chigorsky and Geoffrey waited him. The lamp was once more lighted. Tchigorsky had a grin on his face. "'Foiled her?' he asked. "'I heard you.' "'For the present, at any rate,' Ralph replied. "'That charming woman does me the honor to regard me as a benighted idiot.' Tchigorsky dropped into a chair and rocked to and fro, shaking with noiseless mirth. End of chapter 31。Chapter 32 of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 32 。More from the Past。Geoffrey looked from one to the other for explanation. "'Won't you tell me what has happened?' he asked. 
"'As a matter of fact, nothing has happened,' Ralph replied. "'A little time ago Tchigorsky outlined a bold stroke on the part of the foe. "'He suggested that it was possible, without removing a single bolt or bar, "'to spirit away one of the family, who would never be heard of again. "'Tchigorsky was making no prophecy. He was speaking from knowledge. "'Well, the attempt has been made.' and it has failed. "'Who was the victim, uncle?' "'Your cousin, Vera. Sit down, my boy. If you go plunging about like that, you will ruin everything. Did I not tell you that the attempt had been made and had failed? Vera is safe for a long time to come.' Geoffrey dropped into his seat again. "'How did you manage it, uncle?' he asked. Ralph gave the details. He told the story dryly. So I not only prevented the dastardly attempts to carry Vera away, he concluded, but I baffled the foe altogether. There was not the slightest suspicion that I was on the stairs except by the merest accident. But you say that Marion was with Vera? She was. That nimble wit of hers led her to suspect danger. But Marion could not have averted the tragedy. A slender girl like her could have done nothing against a strong and determined foe. If necessary, she would have been carried off and they would have killed two birds with one stone. Geoffrey shuddered. He was sick of the whole business. For the moment he was a prey to utter despair. It seemed hopeless to fight against a foe like this, a foe striking in the dark and almost moving invisibly. "'Someone ought to watch that room,' he said. "'It is unnecessary. I am supposed to be sleeping close by. Already the foe has learned that I slumber with one eye open.' Don't be cast down, Geoffrey. Two more of the enemy are still on their way to Yorkshire, and when they are here the mouth of the net is going to close. I pledge you my word that no further harm shall come to anybody, and Tchigorsky will say the same. On my head be it, Tchigorsky muttered. He twisted a cigarette dexterously with his long fingers. "'There is nothing to fear,' he said, "'nothing with ordinary vigilance. "'The danger will come when the time for defense has passed "'and it is our turn to attack. "'Then there will be danger for the three of us here. "'Shall we go to bed?' "'I could not sleep for a king's ransom,' said Geoffrey. "'Then we will chat and smoke a while,' said Tchigorsky. If you like, I will go on with the history of our adventures in Lhasa. Geoffrey assented eagerly. Tchigorsky proceeded in a whirl of cigarette smoke. We knew we were doomed. We could see our fate in those smiling, merciless eyes. That woman had lived among civilized people. She knew Western life. She had passed in society almost for an Englishwoman. But she was native at heart. All her feelings were with her people. All the past could not save us. She meant us to die, and die with the most horrible torture under her very own eyes. Her life in India was a masquerade. This was her real existence. "'You fancy you are the first, she said. "'Did you ever know a Russian traveler, Vosky by name?' He was very like you. I recollected the man. I had met him years before, and had discussed this very Lhasa trip. Yes, I said, for it was useless to hold up our disguises any longer. What of him? He came here, the princess said. He learned some of our secrets. Then it was found out, and he had to walk the Black Valley he died. All this was news to me. 
so astonished was i that i blurted out the truth only a year before long after Vosky was supposed to be dead i had met him in london when i mentioned lassa he changed the subject and refused to continue the conversation i fancied that he suspected me of chaffing him now i know that he had been through the horrors of the black valley and escaped the eyes of the princess blazed when she heard this she was a wild devastating fury it seemed almost impossible to believe that i had seen her in a tea gown at simla chattering society platitudes in a white sahib's bungalow and i bitterly regretted betraying myself because i knew that wherever he was vosky would be hunted down and killed as they were seeking to kill me as they would slay ralph ravenspur only they have not recognized him hence the changed face and the glasses geoffrey asked you have guessed it said ralph i did not want to be known i am only a poor demented idiot a fool who cumbers the ground i had betrayed vosky without doing any good to myself tchigorsky resumed if any harm has come to him i am his murderer presently the princess calmed down and the old cruel mocking light came back to her eyes we were speaking english by this time a language utterly unknown to the awestruck open-mouthed priests around us let us pretend that this is my drawing-room in india and that i am entertaining you at tea she said later you shall know something of me in my real character i suppose you recognized the risks that you ran perfectly i replied we are going to be done to death in barbarous fashion because we have come here and learned your secrets as your husband did i could afford this shot i could afford to say anything we were going to perish by a death the horror of which is beyond all words and had i pulled the nose of the princess had i strangled her as she sat there the punishment could have been made no worse take care she said you are in my power what do you mean i mean that your husband penetrated the secrets of buddha and that you married him so as to regain those secrets there were papers and the like or he would merely have been assassinated in the ordinary vulgar manner and there would have been an end to the business your husband has got an inkling of this and that is why he has hidden the documents and refuses to give them up he would be murdered if he did you are a bold man the princess said not at all i replied a man can only die once would you say that the condemned murderer was rash for attempting to pick the pocket of the jailer even for attempting to murder him what i say and what i do matters nothing and you know that i am telling the truth the princess smiled my friend ralph here will remember that smile i could see then ralph muttered and i do remember it very well the princess replied you are candid and i will be the same what you have said about my husband is perfectly true i did marry him to recover those papers and when i accidentally let out the truth that i was not outcast of my tribe he saw his danger he is safe till those papers are mine and then i shall kill him and yet i love that man i shall be desolate without him but my religion and my people come first for them i lose my caste for them i degrade myself by becoming the wife of a white sahib for them i shall eventually die and yet i love my husband ay you cannot command the human heart at this i laughed the princess joined me 
"'You think I have no heart,' she said, "'but you are mistaken. You shall see. For the present I have my duty to perform. I do it thus.' She rose to her feet and clapped her hands and spoke in terse, vigorous sentences. A minute later we were bound and our disguises slipped from us. And there for the present you must be content to leave us. Tomorrow I shall tell the rest. Tchigorsky rose and yawned, but Geoffrey would fain have had more. The princess, he said, at least tell me if I know her. Of course you do. Princess Zara is the woman who calls herself Mrs. Mona May. End of chapter 32Chapter Thirty Three of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Three Vera Sees Something. It was nearly dawn when Vera came to herself out of an uneasy slumber. The darkest hour that precedes the faint flush in the eastern sky was moving away. There was a light in the room. Vera rubbed her eyes, wondering. It was one of her fancies to have no light in her room. Better to lie with horrors she could not see than have the glimmer from a nightlight filling every corner with threatening shadows. Vera sat up in bed, forgetting for the moment that she had a racking headache. Something had happened while she slept. Something was always happening in that house of fears so that Vera was conscious of no new alarm. In a big easy chair at the foot of the bed, Marion reclined, fast asleep. Vera checked an impulse to wake her. In that miserable household, sleep was the most blessed of all luxuries. Why, then, should Marion be disturbed? Doubtless she had come there to protect, and doubtless the girl would know all about it in the morning. "'I will not wake her,' Vera murmured. But she could not sleep herself. The splitting, blinding headache was very much in evidence just now. Vera felt that she would give anything for a glass of cold spring water. She poured out that in her own bottle, but it was flat and tepid. She would go down into the stone-flagged outer kitchen, where the pump was, and get some fresh. In any case, she had not the least idea of going to bed again. Vera partly dressed herself, doing up her hair in a big shining knot, and then, in slippered feet, crept down to the kitchen. She had no need of a light, there was already enough to show the way. How cool and refreshing the water was! She drank a glass and then laved her face in the crystal fluid. All headache was gone by this time, though Vera had a curious trembling of her lower limbs that she could not account for. She opened a side door leading into a green quadrangle and from there made her way to the terrace. For a few minutes she stood in a dark angle facing the house, just picked out as it was from the gloom. Along the dim corridor someone was advancing with a light. What could it mean? What was going on? Vera crouched close into the dark corner. She had an idea that she was going to witness something. The light in the corridor stopped and grew brighter. From the black shadow of the house a human figure crept out and slid along the terrace to a spot where it was just possible for a man of strong courage and cool head to make his way down to the beach at low tide. At high water the sea swept the foot of the cliff. Vera strained her eyes to make out the figure. It passed so close to her that she might have touched the hem of the white diaphanous garment about it. A faint, sour kind of perfume was in the air. 
these swiftly flying feet made not the slightest noise vera guessed at once that this was one of the orientals whom she and geoffrey had seen along the cliffs on a memorable occasion she was not far wrong if not the same they belonged to the same noisome band almost before vera could recover from her surprise another figure followed vera watched with intense eagerness slight and frail though she was she was not in the least afraid she came from the wrong race for that she made up her mind to know what was going on even if she ran into some danger in obtaining the knowledge and what did that light mean she was soon to know presently another figure came along a tall figure which in the gloom bore a strong resemblance to tchigorsky the figure wore boots and a european dress and did not seek concealment by its side was yet another figure also clad in european dress you say this is the place the latter man whispered in indifferent english yes yes was the reply in still more indifferent english it is to this place that my master dr tchigorsky bade me bring you and there is the signal the light in the corridor waved again i am not satisfied the stranger muttered i am in great danger but not here the other said eagerly nobody knows you are here the princess has not the least idea of your presence and dr tchigorsky my master bade me hunt for you until i found you and i have done it oh yes you have done it right enough and dr tchigorsky would not have sent for me unless there had been danger but why not meet him in daylight in a proper and natural manner the other spat gravely on the pavement the doctor is a great man he said he knows would you have your enemies to guess that you have seen my master that is why i bring you here at night that is why there is the great secret the tall man muttered something that sounded like an acknowledgment of the force and cogency of this reasoning i dare say it is all right he said fetch your master the servant salaamed and departed in the direction of the house he returned presently with the information that Tchigorsky had gone along the terrace. There was a summer house a little way off, where Tchigorsky waited. Vera felt her heart beating faster. There was no summer house along the terrace, nothing but a broken balustrade that Rupert Ravenspur was always going to have mended. Over this there was a sheer drop to the sea below. As the pair moved on, Vera followed. Then what followed seemed to happen in the twinkling of an eye. A white-robed figure emerged and flung himself upon the stranger. At the same time the other miscreant, who had acted as Tchigorsky's servant, attacked him from behind. "'You rascals!' the stranger cried, speaking this time in French so i have been deceived you are going to throw me over the cliff there is no escape for me well i don't much mind the agony of suspense has taken all the sweetness out of life for me i knew that sooner or later this was bound to come but i am going to take a toll the stranger's breath was coming rapidly between his teeth vera tried to scream but no sound emerged from her lips. She stood rooted to the spot, watching what seemed to her a long one-sided struggle. As a matter of fact, it had not lasted more than ten seconds. Gradually the stranger was forced back. Back and back they forced him to the very edge of the cliff. There was no escape for him now. 
he reached out two long and swinging hands he grasped two arms one for each of his would-be assassins and then he jumped backwards two fearful wailing yells rent the air there was a mocking laugh and silence had she really seen this thing or had she dreamed it vera was not sure just for a moment her senses left her when she came to herself again she crept along to the house and thence to her bedroom she locked the door and flung herself upon the bed pressing her hands to her eyes how long will it last she murmured how long can one endure this and live oh heaven is there no mercy for us then the blessed mantle of oblivion fell again end of chapter 33chapter 34 of the mystery of the ravenspurs by fred m white this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 34 exit chigorsky it seemed to have been tacitly agreed by geoffrey and marion that nothing could be gained by telling vera of the danger that she had escaped nothing could be gained by a recital of the dastardly attempt on the previous evening and only another terror would be added to the girl's life and heaven knows they all had terrors enough on the other hand vera had made up her mind to say nothing to the family generally as to her startling adventures of course geoffrey and ralph ravenspur would have to know but the rest were to be kept in the dark vera's white face and serious air were accounted for by the headache from which she was palpably suffering some of the others understood and they were full of silent sympathy it is nothing said vera a walk along the cliffs will soon set me right as she spoke she looked at geoffrey significantly he knew immediately that the girl had something important to say to him he slipped outside, and Vera followed him. Not till they were out of sight of the house did she speak. "'Dr. Chigorsky is still about?' she asked. "'Yes, dear,' Geoffrey replied. "'As a matter of fact, he is hiding in Uncle Ralph's room. He has his own reasons for so doing, but the reasons are to remain a profound secret.' I ought not to have told you. You are not to tell anyone." Vera gave a sigh of relief. "'I promise that,' she said. "'And I am exceedingly glad to hear that Dr. Tchigorsky is safe. I was not sure whether I had not seen his murder.' Geoffrey regarded Vera in amazement. "'Why, you were in your room all night,' he cried. You were—' He was going to say drugged, but he pulled himself up just in time. Vera told her story without further preamble. It was a thrilling story, and none the less so because simply told. "'I don't profess to understand it,' Vera concluded. "'I tell it to you just as it happened. On the whole, I thought it as well to keep the information to myself.' I dare say that Dr. Tchigorsky can solve the problem. "'He shall have a chance,' said Geoffrey. "'I'll tell him after luncheon. But I should not tell a soul else this, Vera.' "'I had no intention, Geoffrey. And now hadn't we better go back and say good-bye to Mrs. May? She is leaving the house directly.' Mrs. May did leave the house in the course of the morning, all smiles and blandishments. She had a particularly tender word and squeeze of the hand for Geoffrey, whom she pressed in a whisper to come and see her before long. "'I will,' Geoffrey replied. "'You may rely upon that.' It was with a feeling of intense relief that he was rid of her. 
it seemed hard to believe that the smiling polished woman of the world the darnier cree of western civilization should be one and the same with the fanatic princess of the fanatical east there was something wild and bizarre about the very suggestion there was one last smile for every one but marion who had not appeared and mrs may was gone geoffrey made his way up to his uncle's room there he found the two friends smoking tchigorsky looked at him from behind a cloud of thin smoke you have news my young friend said tchigorsky i see it in your eyes i have the most important news said geoffrey only it does not convey any impression to me it is a discovery of vera's she had a fine adventure last night she was not sure whether or not she had seen your murder tchigorsky say on tchigorsky said calmly say on my boy geoffrey said on accordingly he fully expected to surprise his hearers and he was not disappointed every word he said was followed with rapt attention and now can you explain it geoffrey asked eagerly to me the explanation is perfectly clear tchigorsky replied last night i told you that there were two other parties to the vendetta now in england and that it was necessary to get them into the net before we close it that is no longer necessary for the simple reason that these two men are dead drowned do you mean that they perished with that stranger last night certainly i do a fine determined fellow whose death i cannot sufficiently deplore and he had his vengeance upon his foes if he perished they perished also but who was he tchigorsky the other man my fellow countryman Vosky. don't you remember me telling you how the princess spoke of him he has been hunted down at last they lured him here and destroyed him under the pretense that i wanted to see him my presumed servant had only to mention my name and the thing was done but why bring him here because the place is so quiet because they wanted to give their mistress the princess a pleasant surprise i don't suppose she knew they were coming but the light in the corridor that was a curious and useless coincidence the light in the corridor was mine i was looking for something neither of those miscreants was ever in the house at all at the same time they had naturally been informed where i was today they would have gone to their mistress with the pleasing news that they had dispatched vosky i am certain they were saving the news for her what shall you do about it asked geoffrey i shall not do anything at present tchigorsky replied i have a little idea that may work out to our advantage later meanwhile nobody knows of the tragedy and nobody is to know this afternoon you are going out fishing in a boat but in reality you are going to look for their bodies if you can find them all we are certain to find them all ralph interrupted they will be carried round gull reef on the spit of sand under the caves and deposited on the beach whence the tide ebbs at four o'clock to-day i have not lived here all my life for nothing we shall find those bodies within a yard of where i say and bring them up the cliff geoffrey shuddered ugh you will do nothing of the kind tchigorsky said coolly bring vosky of course but you are to bury the two ruffians in the sand it will be easy to do so and pile some rocks over them afterwards geoffrey ventured to suggest that such a course might end disastrously the officers of the law not to know of it 
Chigorsky waved the suggestion aside contemptuously. It was no time for nice points like these. "'Those foul creatures are dead, and there is an end of it,' he said. "'What can it matter whether there is an inquest held on them or not? "'If it is, then there will be an end of my scheme. "'I say you must do this. "'The future happiness of the family depends upon it. "'It is also of the utmost importance "'that Princess Zara does not know of the death of her miscreants.' Geoffrey nodded. He began to see daylight, and, after all, the concealment of these bodies was no crime. "'What do you say, Uncle Ralph?' he asked. "'Say that Tchigorsky is right,' Ralph croaked. "'Tchigorsky is always right. When we get Vosky's body, what shall we do with it?' "'Lay it out on the corridor, where I can get a look at it said Tchigorsky. For the present I do not exist, at least so far as this house is concerned. All you have to do is to follow my directions. The strange pair set out on their excursion in the afternoon. It was a long pull from the village to the cliffs, but it was accomplished at length. The boat was run aground at the least dangerous spot, and Ralph and Geoffrey set out along the sands. The former step was as free and assured as that of his younger companion. "'Ah!' Geoffrey cried. "'You are right. There they are.' "'I knew it,' Ralph replied. "'See if they are injured.' Geoffrey steeled himself to his gruesome task. The three men lay side by side, as if they had been placed so by human hands. As far as Geoffrey could judge, there were no signs of violence on the bodies of either of the two natives. They lay by each other, their faces transfixed with rage and horror. Beyond doubt, these men had been drowned, sucked down by the strong current, and then cast up again by the sea, as if in cruel sport. "'No hurts on either,' Geoffrey muttered. "'It is possible. Look at the other one.' Geoffrey did so. He saw a face fixed with a grim smile, the smile of the man who can meet death and knows how to punish those who injure them. The face was seared and crisscrossed, just like Chigorsky's and Ralph Ravenspur's. Indeed, with its strange disfigurement, the dead Russian would have passed for Tchigorsky. The face was black and swollen from an ugly bruise in the forehead. Had not he known the truth, and had any one told Geoffrey that Tchigorsky lay there, he would have believed it. A spade had been placed in the bottom of the boat, and with it two deep graves were dug in the sand. Into them the bodies of the Orientals were cast, the sand was made smooth again, and a layer of heavy rocks laid on the top. The body of the Russian was conveyed to the boat and thence to the house. There was nobody to see the mournful entry. All the family were on the terrace. A startled servant or two came forward and gave the necessary assistance to convey the body to the dimly lighted corridor. "'Go to the village and fetch the constable,' said Geoffrey. "'We have found a dead body on the beach.' The servant went off. The gallery was deserted. In a few minutes the family would be in the house again, and the story would have to be told." Chigorsky looked cautiously from his hiding place. "'Is the coast clear?' he asked. "'Perfectly clear,' said Geoffrey. Chigorsky came forward. For a long time he examined the body. The regret on his face was tempered by a gleam of grim satisfaction. "'It is very like you,' said Geoffrey. "'It is me.' Tchigorsky whispered. "'You are to recognize it as me. 
the idea is that i fell over the cliffs in the darkness and was drowned i will explain later somebody comes tchigorsky darted off as marion appeared she looked white and agitated another horror she said sims just told me who is it i regret to say it is dr tchigorsky said ralph he must have walked over the cliff in the darkness see here marion bent over the body with a shudder poor fellow she said tenderly tchigorsky beyond a doubt ralph turned away as if in grief but the grin on his face was the grin of mephistopheles End of chapter 34chapter 35 of the mystery of the raven spurs by fred m white this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 35 mrs may is pleased geoffrey was fain to confess that he couldn't quite follow he turned to ralph who once more had recovered his old expression an expression tinged with profound regret from the hall below came the tones of rupert ravenspur demanding to know what it was all about go and tell your grandfather ralph said quietly everybody who comes near us is faded it seems poor tchigorsky is no more he was a mysterious man and wonderfully reticent as to his past life but he was the most interesting man i ever met but I shall never hear anything more about Tibet. "'He was a very old friend of yours?' Marion asked. "'Not so very old,' Ralph replied. "'And I should hardly call him a friend. We were mutually interested in certain scientific matters. But as to the marvelous side of things, he told me nothing.' Speaking by the letter, this was perfectly true. Tchigorsky had told Ralph nothing, for the simple reason that they had learned and suffered together. "'Then why did he come here?' Marion demanded. "'To try to solve the mystery. He declared that Orientalism was at the bottom of it. But we shall never know now. Tchigorsky is no more, and such knowledge as he may have possessed has gone down to the sea with him marion turned away with a sigh slight as their acquaintance had been she had been drawn to tchigorsky she said strange that whoever tried to help the house of ravenspur should come under the ban but tchigorsky was drowned said ralph no indeed marion replied oh i know there are no signs of violence on the body I know how dangerous the broken balustrade is, but I have my opinion all the same. "'You are wrong in this case,' Ralph said as he walked away. Presently other people began to arrive. For the first time for many years Ravenspur was invaded by strangers, a policeman or two, a fussily polite inspector, a journalist with a colleague pushing everywhere. They would have interviewed Rupert Ravenspur, but the cold glitter of his eye awed even them. The police let Ralph alone, but Geoffrey was subjected to severe questioning. On the whole he came out of the ordeal better than Ralph had anticipated. "'You managed that very well,' he said. "'I feel horribly mean and guilty.' all these prevarications call them lies if you like ralph put in coolly it doesn't matter think of the good cause if ever the end may justify the means it is here you are deceiving only our enemies you are injuring nobody and you are giving tchigorsky a heaven-sent opportunity 
"'I doubt it, uncle. Clever as Tchigorsky is, well as he may disguise himself, he will fail. Did not Princess Zara pick you both out at Lhasa? That was not quite the same thing. Remember, she knew beforehand that we were going to make the attempt to reach the Holy City. She allowed us to go so far because she is naturally a cruel woman. Moreover, all the time her spies had been dogging our footsteps. Before nightfall she will firmly believe Tchigorsky to be dead, which is a great point in his favor. She does not know that her other two miscreants have met with a deserved fate. Tchigorsky will go to her, passing as one of them, and will tell her a wonderful tale as to how he and his ally compassed Vosky's death. He will tell how that death entailed the death of his companion. "'It is a fearfully dangerous position.' "'Oh, it is. But Tchigorsky will not mind that. He loves danger for its own sake, and he will be able to act the character to the life. He speaks the language perfectly. He is up to all the rites and ceremonies. Tchigorsky will not fail.' The inquest was appointed for the afternoon. It was not likely to last long, and the verdict in the minds of most people was a foregone conclusion. Tchigorsky had walked out into the darkness, he had stumbled over the cliffs, and there was the end of the matter. Meanwhile the police seemed to have taken possession of the house. And all the time Tchigorsky was seated in a comfortable lounge in Ralph's room, smoking cigarettes and making plans for the future. Geoffrey had gone out after luncheon. He would not be wanted for a full hour and resented the vulgar curiosity of these strangers. Already some of the jury had arrived and were critically examining the broken balustrades with an owl-like wisdom which in other circumstances would have been amusing. Geoffrey walked along up the slope toward Jessop's farm. He met a small governess cart drawn by a donkey coming down the hill. In it was Mrs. May driving slowly along. She pulled up as she saw Geoffrey and held out her hand. Her face was very clear and bright today. "'You see, I have already adapted myself to circumstances.' she said when Geoffrey had asked politely and feelingly after the injured foot. "'The donkey and I are old friends, and Jessop got the cart for me. So I am all right. "'By the way, what is it I hear about your finding a body down in the sands?' "'It is quite true,' Geoffrey said gravely. "'The body of Dr. Tchigorsky.' "'Tchigorsky?' "'Dr. Tchigorsky? Do you really mean that?' The smooth, velvety voice had risen to a hoarse scream. Disappointment, joy, relief danced across the woman's gleaming eyes. For the moment she seemed to forget that she had a companion. "'What a dreadful thing!' she said, catching her natural voice again. "'How did it happen?' Geoffrey gave her the details without flinching. "'It was a bit of shock for us,' he said, "'but we are accustomed to them. Of course it will be brought in that the poor fellow met with an accident, but there is not the slightest doubt that the poor fellow was murdered.' "'Murdered? Why should you say that?' "'I don't know. Of course I have no evidence.' But Tchigorsky chose to interest himself in our affairs, and he has paid the penalty. That was exactly what Marion said when she saw the body. So that poor child actually saw the corpse? How terrible! Marion did not seem to mind. She is small and slender, but has courage and resolution. Mrs. May nodded. She had received information that was a long way from being distasteful to her. 
she plied Geoffrey with questions as to what Tchigorsky had said and done, but Geoffrey evaded them all. Tchigorsky had said nothing. He had hinted vaguely at what he was going to do. "'I knew him years ago,' said Mrs. May. "'Oh, indeed,' Geoffrey replied. "'He never mentioned that.' Mrs. May drew a long breath. Evidently she had nothing to fear. Her arch-enemy had gone to his account, leaving no mischief behind. Sooner or later the man would have had to be removed. Now he had gone away, saving all the trouble. Really it was very considerate of Tchigorsky. "'You might come to the inquest and say he was a friend of yours,' said Geoffrey. Mrs. May looked at him sharply. Had she said too much, or did he suspect? But Geoffrey's eyes were clear and innocent of meaning. Mrs. May shuddered. These kind of horrors made her ill, she said. "'Pray do not mention that fact,' she implored. "'It can do no good, and it may cause a great deal of harm.' Geoffrey disclaimed every intention of making mischief. Besides, as Mrs. May pointed out, there was his uncle Ralph. Geoffrey shrugged his shoulders. "'It is a hard thing to say,' he murmured, "'but my poor uncle's testimony would not carry much weight. That accident he had some years ago injured his brain, but he is harmless.' Mrs. May exchanged a few more or less banal remarks with her companion and drove on. She had got nothing out of Geoffrey, but he had baffled her and, what was more, had succeeded in lulling a set of lively suspicions to sleep. The inquest turned out as he had anticipated. The suggestion of foul play was never raised. A surgeon testified to the fact that the deceased met his death by drowning and that the injury to the face was doubtless caused by a fall on the rocks. Beyond that the condition of the body was normal. Geoffrey's evidence was plain and to the point. He had little to say. He repudiated the suggestion that the family enemy had had anything to do with the thing. Dr. Tchigorsky was merely a passing visitor. He had met with an accident, and there was the end of the matter. It was impossible to say more than that. Then, to the manifest disappointment of those who had come prepared to be thrilled with sensational details, the inquest was over almost before it had begun. Directed by the coroner, the jury brought in a verdict of found drowned, but how the deceased came by his death there was no evidence to show. Rupert Ravenspur rose from his seat and ordered the servants to clear the house. "'See that they are all out at once,' he said. "'Half an hour ago I found two women, ladies, I suppose they call themselves, in the picture gallery with guidebooks in the hands. Really there is no sense of decency nowadays.' The curious crowd were forced back and once more Ravenspur resumed its normal aspect. "'I will see to the burial,' Ravenspur said. "'The poor man seems to have no friends, and I feel to a certain extent guilty. Geoffrey, you will see that all proper arrangements are made for the funeral?' Geoffrey bowed his head gravely. "'Yes, sir,' he said. I will see to that. End of chapter 35「Chapter 36 of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 36 Mrs. May Learned Something Mrs. May sat among her flowers after dinner. 
She had dined well and was on the very best of terms with herself. It had been a source of satisfaction to see the body of her worst enemy laid to rest in the village churchyard that afternoon. For years she had planned for the death of that man, and for years he had eluded her. To strike him down foully had been too dangerous, for had he not told her that he was prepared for that kind of death? Had he not arranged it so that a score of savants in Europe should learn the truth within a month of his decease? "'And kindly fate has removed him for me,' she said as she puffed with infinite content at one of her scented cigarettes. "'There is no longer any danger.' What have I to fear now from those wise men of the East? Nothing. They will see that Tchigorsky has died a natural death and will destroy those packets. I can act freely now. A strange look came over the lovely face, a look that boded ill for somebody. Then the whole expression changed as Geoffrey entered. She had seen him that afternoon. She had asked him to come, and he had half promised to do so. That Mrs. May hated the young man and all his race with a fanatical hatred was no reason why, for the present, she should not enjoy his society. She was a strange woman, this Eastern, with a full knowledge of Western ways and civilization. She could be two distinct beings in as many minutes. A moment ago she was a priestess, thirsting for the blood of those who had defiled her creed, for the blood of those to the third or fourth generation, and almost instantly she was the charming hostess she would have been in a country mansion or a West End drawing room. She waved Geoffrey to a seat. "'I hardly dared hope you would come,' she said. "'But now you are here, make yourself at home.' There are some of the cigarettes you liked so well, and the claret purchased for me by a connoisseur. I never touch wine myself, but I know you men appreciate it after dinner. Geoffrey took a cigarette and poured himself out a glass of the superb claret. The bouquet of it seemed to mingle with the flowers and scent the room. Geoffrey mentally likened himself to an Italian gallant upon whom Lucretia Borgia smiled before doing him to death. Not that he had any fear of the wine. Mrs. May was a criminal, but she was not a clumsy one. She would never permit herself to take risks like that. Nevertheless, it was very pleasant, for when Mrs. May chose to exercise her fascinations, there was no more delightful woman, and there was always the chance of picking up useful information. Mrs. May touched lightly on Tchigorsky, to which Geoffrey responded with proper gravity. Had Mrs. May known that Tchigorsky himself was not more than a mile away, she would have been less easy in her mind. "'No more visions lately?' she asked. "'No more.' Geoffrey replied. But they will come again. We are hopelessly and utterly doomed. Nothing can save us. It is to be my turn next. Mrs. May started. There was an expression on her face that was not all sympathy. What do you mean by that? she demanded. Geoffrey slowly extracted from his pocket a sheet of paper. He had discovered it in his plate that morning at breakfast time. Long and earnestly it had been discussed by himself and Ralph and Tchigorsky, and it had been the suggestion of the last named that Geoffrey should find some pretext for mentioning it to Mrs. May. "'This was by my plate this morning,' he said. "'I don't mind showing it to you, because you are a good friend of mine. It is a warning.' It was a plain half-sheet of note-paper, the sort sold in general shops at so many sheets a penny. The envelope was to match. Just a few lines had been laboriously printed on the paper. "'Take care,' 
it ran. You are marked down for the next victim, and they are not likely to fail. You are not to go to the sea till you hear from me once more. You are not to venture along the cliffs. If you show this to anybody, I shall not be able to warn you again, and your doom will be sealed. One who loves you. That was all there was. Nothing at the top or the bottom. Mrs. May turned this over with a puzzled face and a hand that shook slightly. Under her smile was another expression, the look of one who has been betrayed and is in a position to lay her hand upon the guilty person. "'You are fortunate to have friends with the enemy,' she said. "'But do you think you were wise to show this to me?' She was playing with him as the cat plays with the mouse. It was a temptation she could not resist, feeling sure that Geoffrey would not understand. But he did, though he did not show it on his face. "'Why not?' he asked innocently. "'Are you not my friend? Personally, I believe it is a hoax to frighten me. You can keep that paper, if you please.' "'Then you are not going to take any notice of the warning?' asked Mrs. May. There was a note of curiosity, sharp, eager curiosity, in the question. Geoffrey did not fail to notice it, though he shook his head carelessly. "'I am going to ignore it, as one should ignore all anonymous letters,' he said. "'If the writer of that letter thinks to frighten me, then he or she is sadly mistaken. I shall go on with my life as if I had never received it. Mrs. May's lips framed the sentence, The more fool you, but she did not utter it. It filled her with satisfaction to find that the warning had been ignored, as it had filled her with anger to know that a warning had been received. And Mrs. May knew full well who was the author of that letter. "'I don't think that I should ignore it,' she said. "'It may be a cruel piece of mischief, and, on the other hand, it may be dictated by a generous desire to help you. So the moral is that you are to keep clear of the cliffs and the sea.' Geoffrey flicked the ash off his cigarette and laughed. He poured himself out a second glass of the amazing claret. "'It is an unusual thing for me to do,' he said. "'But your claret is wonderful. "'You speak of the moral. "'I speak of the things as they are going to be. "'Tomorrow I shall go out fishing alone as if nothing had happened.' "'Ah, but you have not spoken of this?' "'Mrs. May indicated the letter lying on the table. "'Geoffrey looked at her reproachfully.' "'Have we not trouble and misery enough in our house without making more?' he asked. "'Now, I put it to you as a lady of brains and courage. If you had been in my position, would you have shown that to your family?' Geoffrey lay back in his chair with the air of a man who has put a poser. At the same time he had ingeniously parried Mrs. May's question. As a matter of fact, Nobody but Ralph and Tchigorsky had seen the paper, and the latter point-blank refused to give his reasons why the letter was to be disclosed to Mrs. May. She looked at Geoffrey with real admiration. "'I shouldn't,' she said. "'Of course you are right and I am wrong, and I dare say you will be able to take care of yourself.' He was going to disregard the warning. He was going out alone, and nobody knew what was hanging over his head. Here was a fool of fools, a pretty fellow to assist. Much good that warning had done. Geoffrey rose to his feet. "'And now I must go,' he said. "'Still, I hope to come again.' The door closed, and she was alone. Hardly had he departed before a dark figure in a white robe crept out of the gloom of the garden into the room. 
Mrs. May looked at the ragged-looking stranger fixedly. "'Who are you, and whence do you come?' she asked in her native tongue. The man salaamed almost to the ground. "'I am Ben Here, your slave,' he said, "'and I bring you great news.' "'Oh!' Mrs. May said slowly. "'And so you have come at last.' End of chapter 36